tonight. Prabowo for President Ex-Army Strongman Leader Prabowo Subianto declares victory in the Indonesian presidential election after unofficial results showed him trouncing rivals in the third shot at the top job in the world's third largest democracy. A surprising slide. Japan's economy sees a disappointing shrink, falling behind Germany and raising uncertainty about the central bank's future policy plans. Pressing the brakes. Israel faces growing international pressure to hold off on a planned assault on the last refuge for displaced Palestinians in southern Gaza after truce talks end inconclusively. And Odis travels. Odysseus the Moonlander is on its way to resume a mission that left off more than half a century ago. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. Hope you have had a lovely day so far. We have a lot of updates for you on Key Stories tonight and we begin as we did yesterday in Indonesia. After months of uncertainty, Indonesians woke to a new presumed president. Ex-Special Forces Commander Prabowo Subianto, who appeared in unofficial counts to comfortably win the hotly contested election in a single round. The 72-year-old said this victory must be the victory of the people of Indonesia. The ex-Special Forces Commander took nearly 60% of the vote, according to unofficial counts by independent pollsters that have proven to be accurate in the past. The world's biggest single-day election saw nearly 260,000 candidates duke it out over more than 20,000 posts. Prabowo appeared to have an insurmountable lead over his rivals, ex-governors Anis Baswedan and Ganjar Pranowo. Anis, for one, said he was waiting for the official tally, which is set to be announced by March 20th. Process penghitungan belum selesai. The counting process is not finished, he said adding, we will respect the results of the people's aspirations. In the 1990s, Prabowo was feared as a top lieutenant of the late strongman Suharto, who ruled Indonesia as an autocrat for three decades. Prabowo has since transformed his image into a softer, more grandfatherly figure. He's attracted a huge youth following on social media in a country where nearly half of the 205 million strong electorate is under 40. Another boost for him? The tacit backing of the wildly popular incumbent Joko Widodo. He's reached his term limit. Jokowi, as he's known, did not explicitly endorse a candidate, but his son is Prabowo's running mate. The pair have pledged to continue Jokowi's efforts to position the resource-rich G20 economy as a hub for electric vehicles, as well as to extend a massive infrastructure and social assistance push and create millions of jobs. Prabowo's rivals had said they were investigating reports of fraud, but did not provide evidence. Analysts have said there were no signs of electoral fraud. If confirmed, the new president will take office in October. Some surprising news tonight as Japan's economy slipped into a recession as it unexpectedly shrank for a second straight quarter on weak domestic demand, raising uncertainty about the central bank's plans to exit its ultra-easy policies sometime this year. Japanese consumers said they were cutting back on shopping and eating out to save money as the country fell into recession and lost its title as the world's third largest economy. Japan is now the world's number four economy after Germany. Japan has seen a surprise slide into recession as shoppers and businesses prove reluctant to spend. Figures out Thursday show GDP falling 0.4% at an annual rate over the October to December quarter. Analysts had expected a solid increase. Instead, the number marked the second straight quarter of contraction, the usual definition of recession. Private consumption, which makes up more than half of all economic activity, was one big negative, falling 0.2%. But capital spending by firms also fell. Those factors overwhelmed a solid rise in exports. Now some economists fear the current quarter could also see a contraction, with negatives including the aftermath of Japan's New Year's Day earthquake. That all poses a fresh dilemma for the Bank of Japan. 
It had been expected to start moving away from negative interest rates in the coming months, but Governor Kazuo Ueda has said he wants to see signs that rising wages are driving consumption before he acts. Thursday's numbers suggest Ueda may not get the signals he wants to start raising rates. Some economists predict the central bank may even have to sharply downgrade its GDP forecasts. Japan's Nikkei stock index rose around 1% after the data, suggesting some traders are betting rates will stay low for longer than previously expected. Fear is growing among Palestinians packed into their last refuge in Gaza that Israel will soon launch a planned assault on the southern city of Rafah after truce talks in Cairo ended inconclusively. Israel is facing growing international pressure as talks in the Egyptian capital involving the United States, Israel, Egypt and Qatar came to an end without any sign of a breakthrough. Officials did say though that the talks were constructive and would continue. More than one million Palestinians are crammed into Rafah, next to the border with Egypt. Many there are living in tent camps and makeshift shelters after fleeing Israeli bombardments elsewhere in Gaza. The Israeli military says it wants to flush out Islamist militants from hideouts in Rafah and free hostages being held there after the Hamas rampage in Israel on October 7th. However, it has given no details of a proposed plan to evacuate civilians. Israel says it takes steps to minimize civilian casualties and accuses Hamas fighters of hiding among civilians, including in hospitals and shelters, something the militant group denies. Israeli forces shelled eastern areas of Rafa overnight and pounded several areas of Han Yunus in southern Gaza, residents said. Rafa neighbors Egypt, but Cairo has made it clear it will not allow a refugee exodus over the border. At least 28,576 Palestinians have been killed and more than 68,290 injured in Israeli strikes on Gaza since October 7th, the Enclave's health ministry said on Wednesday. Israeli tallies state that at least 1,200 Israelis were killed and around 250 were taken hostage in the Hamas raid on southern Israel on October 7th. Israel has vowed to fight on until it eradicates Hamas and has made the return of the last hostages a priority. Hamas says Israel must commit to ending the war and withdrawing from Gaza. India's top court has struck down a scheme that allowed people to make anonymous donations to political parties, calling it unconstitutional. Electoral bonds were launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government in 2018 to make political funding more transparent. But critics say it's done the opposite and made the process more opaque. Mr. Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party has received most of the funds through the bonds. The scheme was challenged in the Supreme Court as a distortion of democracy. A five-judge constitution bench ruled that electoral bonds violate citizens' right to access information held by the government. The court directed the government-run State Bank of India to not issue any more such bonds to provide identity details of those who bought them and to give information about bonds redeemed by each political party to the election commission within a week. In court, petitioners argue that this defeats the people's right to know about the funding of political parties and promotes corruption. The government contended it was necessary to keep the identity of donors confidential so that they would not face any retribution from political parties. So far, electoral bonds worth 160 billion rupees have been sold in 29 tranches. The BJP appears to be the main beneficiary getting 57% of the bonds compared with the 10% of the main opposition Congress party. Taiwan defended the actions of its Coast Guard after two people on a Chinese speedboat, which got too close to a frontline Taiwanese island, died when their boat overturned while trying to flee a Coast Guard ship. The Coast Guard also released footage of its personnel recovering a casualty following the incident which happened after the Chinese speedboat with four passengers on board entered prohibited waters near Kinmen's bathing islet home to a military garrison. Taiwan, whose government rejects Beijing's sovereignty claims, says China has been using so-called grey zone warfare which entails using irregular tactics to exhaust a foe without actually resorting to open combat, including sending civilian ships into or close to Taiwanese waters. China's Taiwan Affairs Office said Taiwan had for some time been treating Chinese fishermen in a rough and dangerous manner, which was the main reason for the wicked incident. 
Beijing strongly condemned the incident, saying it seriously hurt the feelings of compatriots of both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Ukraine's military and spy agencies said it destroyed a Russian landing warship off the coast of occupied Crimea. Footage was released by Kyiv's defense ministry and it purports to show the operation with naval drones that breached the vessel's port side, causing it to start sinking. There was no immediate comment from Russia, which said earlier that it had destroyed six drones in the Black Sea. The Kremlin declined to comment. This drone footage claims to show the moment when Ukrainian forces destroyed and sank a Russian warship in the Black Sea. Kyiv says it targeted the vessel with naval drones off the occupied Crimean Peninsula. The Ukrainian armed forces, together with the Defense Ministry's intelligence unit, destroyed the Caesar Kunikov, a large landing ship. It was in Ukraine's territorial waters near Lupka at the time of the hit. The Cesar Kunikov is a large amphibious landing ship that dates back to the end of the Soviet era and is used to move assault troops to land quickly in enemy territory. The strike comes as Ukraine switches gears to a defensive stance in the war, hindered by low ammunition supplies and a shortage of personnel. In December, Ukrainian cruise missiles struck another Russian warship in Crimea, helping push back Moscow's forces from the coast and allowing Ukraine to open a crucial shipping corridor for its exports through its southern ports. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has denied to comment on the claimed sinking, saying only that it downed six Ukrainian drones over the Black Sea overnight. This, as Russia's war in Ukraine, is due to enter its third year next week. U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson said a meeting was scheduled with the White House over an unspecified serious national security threat, which sources say is linked to Russia's nuclear capabilities and its attempts to develop a space-based weapon. Johnson said he and three other House representatives with top intelligence privileges would be meeting the White House National Security Advisor, but insisted that the public did not need to worry. I'm not at liberty to disclose classified information and really can't say much more. But we just want to assure everyone, uh, steady hands are at the wheel, we're working on it, and there's no need for alarm. Sources told the threat surrounds Russian nuclear capabilities in space related to satellites. One of them said the issue is serious, but not related to an active capability and not a cause for panic. A source also said the U.S. has told Congress and European allies about the new intelligence, adding it posed no urgent threat. The issue was made public by an unusual cryptic statement released earlier in the day by Republican House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner, who said, quote, I am requesting that President Biden declassify all information relating to this threat so that Congress, the administration and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters on Wednesday he had already arranged the meeting with the four House members before Turner released his statement. That's been on the books. So I am a bit surprised that Congressman Turner came out publicly today in advance of a meeting on the books for me to go sit with him alongside our intelligence and defense professionals tomorrow. That's his choice to do that. Democrat Mark Warner and Republican Marco Rubio, who head up the Senate Intelligence Committee, issued a joint statement saying their panel has the information in question and has been, quote, rigorously tracking the issue. A source said the pair had been briefed on the threat weeks ago. On the road to the White House tonight, Russian President Vladimir Putin has said he would rather have a Joe Biden presidency over Donald Trump ahead of the U.S. election this November. Mr. Biden was the more experienced, predictable person, he said, in remarks sure to raise eyebrows. Adding to this, despite Michigan voters disapproving of the job President Biden is doing, many also say that their family finances are holding steady or getting better, and that leads to a tight race between the incumbent and the former president, Donald Trump, in the Wolverine state.
This comes as a special counsel prosecuting Donald Trump on federal charges involving the former president's efforts to overturn his 2020 election loss urged the U.S. Supreme Court to reject Trump's bid to further delay trial proceedings. Mr. Biden has been a fierce critic of Mr. Putin for years, calling him a killer before the invasion of Ukraine. The Russian president also remarked on his recent interview with Tucker Carlson, saying he had found it disappointing because the questions had not been sharp enough. In a hypothetical 2024 presidential matchup, Biden receives 45% support to Trump's 47% in Fox News survey of Michigan-registered voters. Trump's two-point edge is well within the survey's margin of sampling error. Biden won Michigan in 2020 by less than three points. In 2016, Trump took the state by less than a half point, and that's the only time the state went red since 1988. Trump's legal troubles continue as special counsel Jack Smith said in his filing to the justices that the nation has a compelling interest in seeing the charges brought to trial, adding that the public interest in a prompt trial is at Senate's where, as here, a former president is charged with conspiring to subvert the electoral process so that he could remain in office. If the justices do not immediately reject Trump's request, Smith asked that they take up the case and hear it on a fast-track basis. NATO defence ministers met in Brussels and NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg asserted that Europe is meeting alliance spending targets, countering recent comments by former US President Donald Trump, who hinted that the US might not protect nations failing to meet spending benchmarks. Stoltenberg emphasised the importance of US allies, urging the US House of Representatives to pass a significant military aid package for Ukraine. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Panchami Ratnasekar from Copenhagen in Denmark. Yes, Andrade. He warned that the victory for Russia in its war against Ukraine could embolden China. The European states within NATO are collectively set to invest $380 billion in defense this year, reaching an estimated 2% of GDP in 2024, up from 1.85% in 2023. Stoltenberg clarified that 18 NATO allies are expected to meet the 2% of GDP defense spending target this year, surpassing last year's figure of 11 nations. He stressed that criticism directed towards NATO is about the individual allies not meeting spending goals, adding that the increased military spending by European allies demonstrates a positive response to this concern. He also highlighted the significance of NATO in defense, noting that 80% of the alliance defense expenditure come from non-EU NATO allies. As NATO members grapple with evolving geopolitical challenges, including tensions with Russia and the rise of China, Stoltenberg emphasized the need for a comprehensive strategy. Back to you, Andrade. All right, thank you very much. That was other there in a World News Special Correspondent Panchami Ratnasekar from Copenhagen in Denmark. Let's go for a short commercial break. More World News on the other side. Welcome back. A moon lander built by Houston-based aerospace company Intuitive Machines was launched from Florida on a mission to conduct the first U.S. lunar touchdown in more than a half century and the first by a privately owned spacecraft. The company's Nova Sea lander, dubbed Odysseus, lifted off shortly after 1 a.m. EST atop a Falcon 9 rocket flown by Elon Musk's SpaceX from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. A live NASA SpaceX online video feed shows showed the two-stage, 25-story rocket roaring off the launch pad and streaking into the dark sky over Florida's Atlantis coast, trailed by a fiery yellowish plume of exhaust. About 48 minutes after the launch, the six-legged lander was shown being released from Falcon 9's upper stage about 139 miles above Earth and drifting away on its voyage to the moon. Moments later, missions operations in Houston received its first radio signals from Odysseus as the lander began an automated process of powering on its systems and orienting itself in space, according to the webcast commentators. Plans call for Odysseus to reach its destination after a week-long flight with a February 22nd landing at Crater Malapert near the moon's South Pole. If the successful flight would represent the first controlled descent to the lunar surface by a U.S. spacecraft since the final Apollo crewed moon mission in 1972 and a first by a private company. 
a stingray named Charlotte has defied the odds by apparently getting pregnant without a mate at a small aquarium in North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains. The team said there is a remote possibility that Charlotte was impregnated by a bamboo shark that shared an enclosure but said it is far more likely that parthenogenesis took place. Parthenogenesis, which translates to virgin creation in Greek, is a relatively rare process of asexual reproduction that occur in some animals when an embryo is developed within an unfertilized egg. In September last year, swelling caused staff at the Team Echoes Aquarium and Shark Lab to be concerned that Charlotte may have developed cysts or have cancer, but an ultrasound later confirmed that she was pregnant. They say that after Charlotte's so-called virgin birth, they will conduct DNA tests to finally settle the question of how she actually became pregnant. For well, the last time there was a virgin birth, a religion was born. Who knows what's to come? Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. See you next time. Have a good night.